now. And um, <clears throat> so the, this is um, the first webinar in the uh, series that the that our climate declaration has been organizing over the last couple of years. The general topic has been on the economy of enough. Uh, it's a term that uh, Jeanette Fitzsimons uh, <clears throat> created some time ago and she wrote a, a really excellent little booklet uh, describing that. And I, I'm, I'm sure that you will cover many of the ideas in there as well as some additional ones. Um, our series has covered a broad range of topics related to the economy of enough and most of the um, webinars are available on the Our Climate Declaration website. So you can, if you've missed any of past ones, you are welcome to go and uh, have a look at some of the ones that have been presented already. And, and this session will also be put on that uh, website. So the format will be that you will be speaking for about 30 minutes, plus or minus, and then we'll have an open uh, question and answer session. So it'll be, everyone will have an opportunity, well, many of you hopefully will have an opportunity to uh, uh, ask questions and we can have more of a dialogue uh, about these important issues. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to how many uh, of you that are currently here are members of the um, the green growth group for the for the green party could you please use the uh, reaction at the bottom of the screen and as i've done on my screen here put up just put up a hand and signify that you're a member of the uh the green growth group for the green party i'm just curious as to how many do you, do you mean degrowth I'm sorry. Yes, degrowth <laughs> not, not, not green growth. No, we're not not about green growth. It's about degrowth. Thank you, Judy. Um, so, if you would would put up your hand with the the reaction at, at the lower lower part of your screen, uh, just be interesting to see how many we we have. Okay, let's. So it's interesting. There are a number, a number of people who are not part of that, but are still interested in the whole degrowth issue. And I think that's terrific. So that's good. I'm just curious about that. Okay, you can lower your hands now, um, but you can put them up later when we um, have a Q and A. So you also know how to how to do that. And I'll I'll try to um, recognize them and go through. So you uh, you Ferguson has. Um, done a number of things in his life, um, including in the theater and IT. Uh, and he's uh, become very interested in this issue of degrowth and has gone to some extent to educate himself and has become very knowledgeable about it. And as I understand that uh, you was either the or at least one of the founders of the Green Degrowth Group and has been um, very instrumental in and making that happen and um, organizing and providing material for it. So we're very fortunate to have him available this evening to um, give us a, a bit of an overview of degrowth. And, and I asked them, I said that the, the folks that are likely to attend are likely to already understand a lot of the reasons for the need for degrowth. And that hopefully we can, uh, you know, touch upon that a bit, but not dwell on that, but move on to what do we do about it? So we're, we're hoping that the, uh, the focus of our discussion could be more on how we deal with the, uh, the challenge of uh, overconsumption and, um, and, and actually have a sustainable future. So with that introduction, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Ferguson. The, Thank you very much. Uh, chair is um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh. Um, okay. Um, 
I thought I would um, take a different approach with um, this session. I have a sort of spiel that I go through about, um, about degrowth, but um, I wanted to put a different spin on it by looking at um, some of the, the narrative, some of the issues um, that um, confuse the degrowth issue. Um, but first, um, just a bit, a, li a little bit more background about me. I'm, um, I'm basically an economics skeptic, um, and have been for some time since I first read a, a little booklet called the, the Anti-Economist Papers um, from way, way back. And I suppose you could say that's that's what I am, an anti-economist. Um, so um, I have some formal um, um, study in um, ecological economics, um, and but mostly I'm um, self-taught. Um, the my position on um, degrowth is, um, I suppose, a little bit specialised. I'm only really interested in implementing degrowth. Um, there's an awful lot of um, academic and um, activist discussion about re degrowth. Um, if you have a look at um, some of the, um, the websites like degrowth.info um, and look at some of the um, uh, listings of papers for some of the conferences, you'll find a huge range of um, discussions. Um, often quite abstruse um, and um, to my mind, not very pragmatic. So that's, that's what I want to focus on um, tonight. Um, there are a lot of, um, I suppose, dualities, if you like, in degrowth, um, things that are um, uh, counter to each other. Uh, first, there's um, issues around the, you know, the confusion between post-growth and degrowth. Um, there's a lot of focus on um, the ends of degrowth, where we want to be, um, that utopia we want to be in, but there's very little focus on, on the means to get there. Um, voluntary and involuntary degrowth. Um, I suppose you could say uh, involuntary degrowth is chaotic collapse. Um, what we're aiming for is a planned degrowth. Um, we know it's going to happen anyway. Um, we need to plan accordingly. Um, the, um, the big one, um, the big issue I find with um, talking about degrowth is the um, conflict between, if you like, realism and hope. Um, an awful lot of um, time, I was going to say gets wasted, but I guess not wasted. Um, there's an awful lot of discussion on um, um, how we portray um, degrowth to the public. Um, I, um, as I say, I'm a skeptic. I've spent a lot of time um, looking at the out and out bullshit that comes from um, the economics discipline and from um, those reacting against the environmental movement. So I tend to possibly overstate realism. I think it's utterly important that in what is really a last ditch attempt to deal with climate change, that we be um, as realistic as possible. Um, I have found that in um, meetings, discussions, um, in the Degrowth Greens Network, that um, people get quite demoralized by that. So um, one of the big issues is how we are going to balance 
realism against hope. Um, so um, post-growth versus degrowth. Um, oh, sorry, before I go on, I should um, state my definition of um, degrowth. Um, so I define degrowth as the deliberate, planned, stable reduction in the scale of the economy to attain a final steady state well within the biophysical limits of the Earth's system while maximizing equitable well being within those constraints. So we'll refer to back to that as we go on. Um, the first, um, one of the most confusing um, dualities with degrowth is the contrast between post growth and degrowth. Um, it's very blurred. Um, and possibly much the same issues come, come up in both areas. Um, many of the same policy proposals come up in both areas. Um, I tend to define post-growth as looking at um, where we want to get to, what things are going to be like after growth has been reduced and, and a steady state has been reached. Um, whereas degrowth, I think, is more about how we go about degrowing, how we go about reducing the size of the economy. Now, that's maybe a bit of a, an arbitrary distinction, as I say, because much the same, the, the discourse is very much the same in, in, in both. Um, I'm possibly, um, the, the main point is that one, um, if I can dare to say it, is a bit utopian, whereas the other um, should at least aspire to be more pragmatic. And that, as I say, is my focus is on how we can you know, practically bring about degrowth. Tied to that is um, I've been reading a lot of critiques of um, degrowth recently, mainly around um, policy. Um, and the consensus seems to be that um, as, far, as far as policy prescriptions go, um, they're vague, um, they're a mixture of goals and objectives and uh, actual policies, mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. And there is actually very little said about the process of degrowth, the actual you know, trajectory of the transition. And I, I agree with the critics, um, this is a big, big problem. Um, some of the critics point out that, you know, degrowth has been a thing for 20 years now, but we don't actually have much in the way of transition plans. Um, again, the ends, uh, the goals are well explored, and but the means to get there are not. Um, Excuse me, just look at my notes. Um, um, one of the best um, books that I've read about um, degrowth, about actually implementing degrowth, um, is the macro, uh, Macroeconomics of Degrowth by uh, Timothée Parikh. And even that um, doesn't, um, even though it pays great attention to the policy process and um, how degrowth policies are formulated, it still doesn't come up with um, any sort of transition. There's a tendency to, um, in most prescriptions, simply to list a 
a number of policies and sort of plunk them down on the table and say, here they are, just do these and everything will be okay. Um, I think that's naive for a number of reasons. Um, the the degrowth, the sorry, the growth imperative of capitalism is immensely strong, and um, the you know capitalism's tendency to um, commoditize, to create new markets, um, and so on is um, so pervasive that I don't think that um, any of the policies that I've seen proposed of themselves are powerful enough to bring about degrowth. Um, examples range from um, uh, dealing with inequality. I recently came across an article that um, suggested that um, given the, the huge um, wealth in the temp top 10% or the top 1%, that by dealing with um, that we could um, fund and um, provide, if you like, the, the gap, the wealth gap needed to accommodate um, degrowth. So redistribution would enable us to degrow. Um, that's all very well, but um, what what brings about the reduction in equality? Um, so um, I've tended to, um, when thinking about policies for growth, um, classify them in, in, in three ways. Sorry. Um, I've tend um, first of all, um, there are the policies we need to um, trigger degrowth and that's that's the critical thing that is what is lacking um, and I'll talk about some possibilities um, in a minute um, next we need policies that um, stabilize the system while undergoing degrowth and um, again I'll give some examples and finally um, we need to deal with um, or maintain or maximize um, people's well-being while undergoing degrowth. So um, what sort of policy, what sort of intervention would disable the capitalist growth imperative? Um, well, um, there's a there are certain ones that have been suggested. Um, the uh, doing away with debt-based money has been suggested as one possibility. Um, zero or even negative interest rates is another. Um, and you can see that um, these um, are designed to act against the ability of businesses to um, expand. Um, so, um, my preference um, is to focus on energy. Um, as you all, I'm sure, know, um, energy, GDP, resource use, um, material throughput, uh, fossil fuels, uh, fossil fuel use, um, and emissions are all highly correlated. So I think that is the, um, the best possible lever um, to um, disable that growth imperative. Um, now, um, some of those on its own, um, I'm not sure. Um, I think it would be enough, but um, it's possible that some of the other policies I've just mentioned um, like um, getting rid of debt-based money um, would be needed in addition, um, if you like, to give the, um, the coup de grace um, to capitalist growth. Um, 
the policies needed to stabilize the system. Um, an example of um, the need for that is the effect um, of, of the relationship between um, a shrinking economy and private debt. Um, as turnover, you know, businesses turnover as wages fall, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's going to be, become harder and harder for businesses and people to service debt. Now, um, there's a range of, poss you know, a range of um, um, policies been suggested for that. Um, um, the most extreme example, I suppose, is um, proposals for debt jubilees, but I believe it is possible for, um, if you like, less sledgehammer approaches. Um, another example is um, as the economy shrinks and our um, uh, exports decrease, um, what do we do about um, our balance of payments and the ability to buy the sort of um, uh, technology that we need to maintain our essential infrastructure. So I see that as another big, big problem. Um, and later in, in, in about a week or so, um, Degrowth Greens are going to talk to Jane Kelsey about um, the implications of this. Um, then finally, there are the um, policies needed to um, counter mitigate the effects of degrowth. Um, and these are largely the policies that um, have already been um, proposed by people um, for degrowth, thinking that they are sufficient to bring about degrowth. And some examples are um, localization, um, a shorter working week, you know, greater um, sharing of um, work time, um, a, um, a UBI or UBS. Um, these are all um, big ticket um, sort of policies, of course. Um, then there are a lot of um, smaller ideas, if you like. Um, such as uh, urban gardens, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, um, so, excuse me a minute. Jack, can I just ask how we're going for time? Um. Another uh, 10, 15 minutes at least, you would be fine, yep. I think. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, as I said, that's my primary interest. Um, I think we badly need to um, um, actually work on some sort of transition plan. And when I say that, I don't underestimate how huge a job it is. But partly um, it's important, um, it's important for its own sake, but it's important as something that needs to be seen to be done. And the reason for that is um, just moving on to a different area, um, is the question of how we, um, how we sell this politically. And I suppose my um, short answer to that is that we can't sell it politically. It's simply not possible. Um, I've been reading recently about um, social tipping points. Um, supposedly, um, uh, socially, you know, the, um, the social system of ideas, um, groups, uh, et cetera, et cetera, civil society um, is a, a complex system um, and 
um, naturally it has tipping points. So the idea is that um, there may be tipping points that an, allow an idea to spread rapidly and um, be taken on comprehensively. Now that sounds like a very um, sort of vague and rather idealistic hopeful, hopeful wish, but I think it is um, the only way that degrowth is going to be um, accepted. So basically, um, you know, to put it baldly, um, we're waiting for people to get so desperate at how things are going that the idea of degrowth um, becomes reasonable. Um, that's obviously not enough in itself. Um, we need to, um, we can hopefully um, bring that tipping point closer by um, promoting the idea of degrowth. And I'm very much in favor of simply making the idea of degrowth as common and pervasive as possible so that people, people are familiar with it. They may not um, take it seriously, but um, at least they have some idea of what's involved. Those more interested or more um, um, amenable um, perhaps have a better idea. Um, so we're you know, encouraging that tipping point to come closer. Um, at the same time, um, we have to have um, some sort of um, uh, transition plan again in place um, that um, gives weight to the idea of degrowth um, so that people can see that there are um, there are there is a way out um, under degrowth. Um, so I see that as the two arms of um, the you know, of a degrowth movement. Um, for, you know, familiarizing the idea, educating people about it, um, and also backing that up with real concrete proposals for. Um, how degrowth is going to be implemented. Um, the, um, as for um, a transition plan, um, as I say, there is very little, um, a, very little in the literature that, um, that helps in that area. And um, it is a huge undertaking um, here in New Zealand. Well, um, as far as economic models go, um, I don't know of any that deal with um, degrowth directly. There are a few people like um, Peter Victor and Tim Jackson who um, have done biophysical models of the Canadian economy. I talked to Peter Victor about how that might be adapted um, to look at degrowth, but um, there's very little possible, well, yes, not much possibility there. Um, Peter, uh, Steve Keen um, has uh, got an economic model, which is um, more based around money, but he is working on introducing energy um, into that model and um, further down the track, biophysical, um, um, a biophysical aspect to the model. So there, are, there is a little going on. Um, but here in New Zealand, um, about 10 years ago, when I um, started doing a um, ecological economics masters, um, the um, ecological economics um, department at Massey was looking at an input output model for um, New Zealand. So in the intervening 10 years, there may be um, a lot more to work with. Um, but um, I suspect that at least initially, um, 
any sort of transition plan that we were to come up with would be, um, shall we say, a, a qualitative one. Um, how do we, um, going back to um, energy as the, um, the trigger for a degrowth transition, um, my money is on um, carbon rationing. Um, I don't take um, the emissions trading scheme or, or, in fact, any sort of pricing, um, carbon pricing approach um, all that seriously. Um, I think that carbon rationing is the only um, technically feasible way of reducing emissions. Um, to a certain extent, um, that's um, a rhetorical statement. Um, you know, it is conceivable that um, if they manage to cobble together um, a better version of the um, emissions trading scheme, that um, that may be effective in um, reducing emissions. But um, carbon pricing, carbon markets, emissions trading, um, frankly, um, have been pretty much designed to favor business, um, to give um, options for um, opportunities for business rather than specifically focusing on reducing um, carbon consumption and emissions. I don't see any point in um, promoting anything less than carbon rationing. Um, I'm, as I've said, I'm a skeptic. Um, nothing I've seen in any of the um, so-called solutions for climate change um, have impressed me. Um, you know, despite James Shaw, James Shaw's recent comments about um, us turning the corner on um, resource decoupling, um, nothing is nothing of any significance is happening there. So um, I believe, and um, I know Jack believes that um, carbon rationing is the um, the only technical feas technically feasible um, approach. It's a big sell once again. So um, we fall back on um, that idea that it's a solution that we have ready, planned for, designed for when um, the public, the government, um, becomes amenable to it. Um, okay, so um, I seem to have come to a natural point in my... I'll just double check my notes to see if... Um, Okay, I seem to have um, covered everything, and um, I suspect we're rather um, early in the piece to start questions, but um, what do you think, Jack? Okay. Um, thank you, you. That was terrific. I, I think that has provided us with a really excellent overview of many of the basic issues. And you know, I think we can we can all thank you for having thought through this process and identified some of the challenges uh, that remain. Um, you know, we, we can agree or disagree with various aspects of what he's what he's suggesting, but he's he's done a terrific job of giving us something to respond to. Um, so I thank you for that, you, and I'm, I'm sure many many others here will do that as well. I have left out a lot of detail, which I hope um, will come out sure. in um, questions. One of the things that you, I, I know you have an extensive bibliography, uh, and I assume that you were, you're willing to share that with people. 
can you identify where it can be available or if you would like to send me a link I can make sure that it, it goes up on the um, our climate declaration website yeah that was one of the things I was going to to provide yeah. there okay yeah. so just to let everyone know that uh, in a few days time we'll put a link on the our climate declaration website to the um, the resources that you has identified and um, I'm going to ask people to again use the um, hand raising uh, tool at the bottom of the um, your screen if you would like to put a question to you and uh, then we can have a discussion about it the um, I just want to make a, a brief comment and about the, the fact that I think we have to accept that we don't know how to do this the, the task is enormous uh, it's never been done before and anything like the kind of scale required so I think we have to recognize and, and uh, you know not beat ourselves up about it but accept some humility that um, we're, we're in uncharted waters so we, we need to keep challenging each other we need to keep sharing ideas and challenging each other uh, and looking at you know the many different aspects of this to see if you know collectively we can I'm not going to say solve the problem because I'm not sure there is a solution to the predicament we're in but I do believe that we can uh, make things less bad and and that that would be a very important thing to to do so having said that um, I see there's a couple of hands going up and if any of you have put questions into the chat um, I would appreciate you putting your hand up and you can um, deliver the, uh, the question yourself. So we'll start out with uh, Kath Wallace. Go ahead, Kath. And, um... uh, Kira, and thanks, Hugh. Um, I, I agree with a lot of what you say, but I think that other people um, are often quite scared of degrowth. I mentioned it the other day in a select committee hearing, and. Um, got sort of what <laughs> kind of reaction um, and I do think we need to be much clearer about what we're saying is to shrink um, or degrow um, and I don't know um, that it's helpful to make people feel that if we have less throughput in the economy and less consumption that we will inevitably all feel worse off um, and I think we need to acknowledge for sure that having some kinds of consumption are going to um, drive up energy use or, or carbon use um, or emissions um, but I do think we need to be clearer what is shrinking what do we think should shrink and how do we feel we can actually maintain um, quite a bit of well-being while doing that? Because really not saying whether you're talking about inputs or outputs or emissions or what leaves it up to people's imaginations and that can scare people. Thanks. Okay, a um, couple of comments about that and also about um, what um, Jack said. and. Also, referring back to my definition, I talked about um, the scale of the economy. Um, my feeling is that um, we'll be damn lucky to get anything. Um, and um, the first thing we have to do is deal with climate change. Um, to get any reduction by any measure in the economy, whether it's um, throughput or energy or GDP um, is absolutely essential. So um, I agree with you, but I think that um, our urgent task is simply to reduce the scale of the economy. 
Now, having said that, um, going back to what Jack said, um, I think um, this is going to be a very iterative process. We are going to, whatever we use to limit um, growth, um, limit the size of the economy, we will be capping and reducing year on year. But it's going to be absolutely essential to, um, to measure and um, measure the effects on the economy, on well-being, on equity, et cetera, et cetera, the state of various um, environmental systems and calibrate um, as we go and apply some of these um, mitigating policies as we go. So yes, um, we do need to emphasize that it's selective degrowth, but um, I tend to de-emphasize that because I feel that, um, as I said, with that three-part model, um, the first urgency is to degrow simply to deal with climate change. And the um, stabilizing policies and mitigating policies will deal with um, ensuring that, um, that we are selective because part of the issue is going to be we, rather than trying to apply, apply policies to reduce the size of the economy, we're reducing it and we're applying policies to make the best of that. And I think that's an essential distinction. So we'll be looking to um, cut energy use by say 5% a year. Um, and having done that, look for ways to um, maximize the use of, of what we have. So we're going to be, have to be selective about um, what, we, uh, what we spend that energy on. Um, and it, part of this is that shit, simply by reducing the scale of the economy, we are going to have knock-on effects that um, deal with a whole range of issues. But um, whether those knock-on effects are positive or negative depends on what mitigating policies we apply. Sorry, that was a bit garbled, but um, I hope you get the idea. Okay, well, we'll go on to the next party. Well, I, I'd just like to make a comment and suggest that one of the things we might think about in terms of what needs to decline, um, I mean, I, I would agree with you that everything needs to decline, but most importantly, overconsumption consumption does, that does not contribute to well human well-being um, I think is is uh, should be the first target there's all kinds of waste and excessive consumption that uh, we know I mean the top 10 percent of earners globally contribute 50 percent of the emissions and 50 percent of the damage done not only to the environment but to the all the ecosystems so, Changing the behavior of that top 10% in terms of the excess consumption, uh, I think would go a long way to uh, getting us where we need to be with climate as well as with overshoot. Okay, Robin, uh, you had your hand uh, up. Can I, sorry, Jack, can I just sorry, comment ahead. on that? that one, yeah. um, one thing that I didn't bring, I didn't delve into carbon rationing at all, and possibly I should have. But um, one of the um, points about carbon rationing is that um, it's a per person allocation. Um, so um, to, to some extent, to a first approximation that deals with, that, that can deal with the issue of um, disproportionate consumption. Yeah. Okay, thanks, you. Uh, Robin, go ahead. Uh, kia ora and thank you for that, Hugh. You, you touched briefly on education, really, to, to bring the concept of degrowth much more into the public arena. Um, you also made a comment that, you know, 
having the the plan sort of in place for when the public or government are ready for degrowth and I kind of question whether they ever will be, uh, whether it's by design or disaster. So I just wonder if you have any idea on how these concepts can be introduced so, so they can be seen as a, a good option for a livable future, you know, not, um, not a future of, of kind of loss and pain, but a good, a good future. And I know we've discussed the concepts of, of needs versus wants. And sadly, I think that's going to vary a lot between the, the 1% or the 10% and the rest of us, having seen the influx of um, big SUVs and motorboats and jet skis and so forth over the summer. But uh, I come back to XR's tell the truth. If, if the public don't actually understand how dire the situation is and that deep growth is going to happen by design or disaster, um, I can't see them being willing to, yeah, take the bitter medicine as some may see it. Um, with my um, realism hat on, um, I agree with you. I think it's highly unlikely that um, that um, the public will um, take this kindly. Um, it's 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 inevitable, really. But um, we have to try. Um, the default is a chaotic, unplanned. Um, <laughs> collapse basically I try not to use the word collapse anymore because it gets people up and up in arms but it is a collapse I mean the latest um, estimate from um, the the last iteration of the limits to growth study is is 2040 so um, to some extent I'm banking on um, people's increasing desperation um, I should point out to another ish, another area that I um, I left out is that we are already in degrowth. Um, you know, we've been talking for about thirty years about um, secular stagnation, about how growth is um, tapering off in in Western economies, um, the wage share is decreasing, productivity is decreasing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, People are aware of all that. People are getting desperate. Uh, you could argue that, well, I know some people do argue that the stuff that's going on in, at, in Parliament grounds in Wellington is um, largely due to that. The increase in um, right-wing governments around the world, um, it's all due to this perception of um, that um, we're not progressing things are not getting better. And that, in fact, is one of the, the biggest arguments about um, uh, the greatest objections to degrowth, that we need growth for social cohesion, for the sense of um, going somewhere, of um, improving. Um, so um, that is inherently going to be lacking. Um, we, um, you, I think you said, um, we have to speak the truth, um, as strongly as possible. Yes, I believe that. Um, but we also have to, like I said, show that there are ways around it. Um, and some comparisons with earlier times, um, might be useful in that respect. I mean, to go back to the, um, the time when New, New Zealand was sustainable, um, I've heard various figures, you know, various years ban banded about, um, you know, the 70s, the 50s, um, um, et cetera, et cetera. Those were not terrible times to live in. Um, and being selective about what we give up, uh, putting it to people that, um, we must be selective about what we keep and what we give up. Um, 
it puts um, it gives them some autonomy in a sense that they make the decisions about um, what is important, what they need in their lives, what we need to retain. Um, so I think um, there's a lot of also a lot of um, material in the the post growth and and degrowth um, movement about um, envisaging um, life after capitalism, after after growth and after capitalism, and um, so those those visions are there, and I think that they can be publicised and. Um, they may be seen as utopian, and they certainly will be in the short term, but again, as people um, get more desperate, as we if we can show a path to those scenarios, to those um, alternative utopias, if you like, then um, that may make a difference. Okay, okay. You, um... thank you. Kaz, uh, Sheldon, I believe you had your hand up next. If you could unmute yourself and, and if possible, um, start your video as well, Kaz. Thank you. Okay, I came off, I came off video because I was eating. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, okay, I just wondered, you know, how, are you not bringing the sociologists and the psychologists into this conversation? And the reason I'm saying that is because again and again, I'm constantly seeing people saying what gives them the greatest pleasure, what gives them the greatest joy, what gives them the greatest sense of happiness in life is their connection with other people and their connection with the natural world. You know, the sunrises and sunsets and you know all these kinds of things. All these things that money can't buy. Yeah. And this, you know, if the degrowth mo movement starts bringing its focus to like, well, where is real pleasure found? Then there's much less of an argument. There's much less concern about, you know, what you might lose out on. And as long as we kind of carry on with the belief that, you know, if you can't travel as often in your car, um, if you can't have, a, have whatever new gadget, whatever obsolescent built-in, you know, fridge, whatever, whatever, yeah. whatever, how much happier would you be if your fridge lasted 30 years rather than five? Sure. You know, yeah. I mean, that's a very practical example. So I just feel like we, we're not selling degrowth in terms of actually increasing human happiness by increasing possibilities of connection between people and easier living. So that's what I wanted to bring up. And I just wondered, you know, are there psychologists and sociologists being invited to come on board here? Um, well, in the, in the wider degrowth movement, there's um, just about everybody. Um, and there's no shortage of those those perspectives, and to some extent, they've, they're the perspectives of um, the existing sustainability movement, um, the well-being movement, you know, independently of um, degrowth. Um, so I think those things are there. What um, to some extent these um, utopias, I'll call them again, um, are seen as um, they're always sort of free, free floating and not connected to um, history and, and um, pros, you know, a way of getting there. And this is what I've tried to emphasize is um, those things are very good and they're essential, in fact, but how do we get from here to there? I mean, somebody um, may, and I'm sure people already do, think it would be wonderful to have um, a three-day week, but how do they get to that? So, you know, their dependency on the systems that um, surround them, they're embedded in those capitalist systems. 
how do they get out of those and get to a sustainable low level um, uh, way of living and that's 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 what I'm concerned with. Sorry, that sort of didn't answer your question, but um, did in a way. So all those all those things you've mentioned are there. They are promoted by the degrowth movement, and there are people. Um, it's truly amazing to look at the um, the listings, the proceedings from the average degrowth um, conference. Every possible perspective is represented there. Okay, thanks. Thank you both, Cass and you. Um, Paul Bruce, you're next. Oh, thank you, Hugh. Um, we, we, we're all very conscious of increasing costs, inflation, and a lot of that's imported just because of the increasing um, costs of extraction of natural resources. And um, but basically, that, that seems to be creating more inequities where the bit rich can buy what they want. And that seems to be an argument that a lot of people would support for rationing by allocation rather than price. Yep. Hence resource allocation and rationing and tradable energy quotas. But, um, you know, I, I, I guess as well alongside that, you need those other things which you did talk about, like universal public services and base income and good social safety nets. Yeah. Um, but... And, and you know the attacks on the wealthy as well but um so can all those can we use that argument of equity to get to to a, a rationing scheme like teqs tradable energy quotas absolutely um and i think it's it's one of the um the most powerful arguments one thing i forgot while i think about it to mention was that part of the reason that um i push energy as the, the trigger for degrowth is that um, climate change um, gives us the excuse, if you like. Um, we know we have to get emissions down. It's the very first priority, but that allows us to ration energy. And that in turn will um, help deal with um, other problems. Simply reducing the size of the economy will deal with all sorts of environmental um, and some social issues. But yes, going back to equity, again, it is um, a good rationale for um, carbon rationing. Okay, thanks to you both. Um, John, I think you're next. Thank you. I have for the last 10 years been studying uh, uh, studying new energy sources uh, that don't come out, that don't emit carbon. Um, and uh, I don't know whether I see this as a relief or as more of a problem, but over the last, particularly the changes over the last year, I'm seeing at least three technologies that uh, will be with us likely in the uh, in the next uh, seven or eight years by nineteen by twenty thirty, uh, which will provide, I believe, uh, carbon free uh, energy. Now I don't look at this with delight because I think that if it happens, if we get abundant uh, carbon free energy. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that we won't continue ecological overshoot. In fact, it might accelerate ecological overshoot. But it does raise cautions in my mind uh, about using carbon uh, as the means to look at, uh, at degrowth uh, as, a, as a way to limit. Um, the more I look at the recent technology, the break, uh, breakthroughs, and the recent business investment in these new technologies, the more I think that like it or not, we may see relief um, of, uh, of growth in the, in the Earth's temperature over the next 15 years, uh, which doesn't, in my view, totally eliminate the problems um, of ecological overshoot. 
but it does give for me caution about using carbon as the method of regulating that. Okay. Can I just ask what the, the three technologies are that you, you mentioned? Yes, certainly. Uh, the, the one of them is an old fashioned technology, but it's now, re it's now reached the point where it's cheaper to build the, than a power station. And that is the mirror hot salt system that runs 24, that runs uh, 24 seven. Um, so it provides continuous energy. It has a relatively low cost of building, which is why it's now uh, competitive with other sources of energy that we build. build. The second is the new development in, uh, in small scale, relatively safe um, nuclear fission systems using, the, using hot sodium as the heat exchanger, which is what gives them their relative safety. And Bill Gates and others are looking at making these available at relatively low cost uh, in the time frame of the next four or five years. And the last is the idea that I thought would never happen in less than 50 years is the idea of nuclear fusion. But the breakthroughs that have happened over the last year and the three or four companies now that are uh, saying that they'll have systems available before, 19, before 2030 is the third. That one is obviously the one that has least certainty to it, but the developments recently make me start to believe it will happen in that time frame. Okay. Um, my my first question is, um, well, just in passing, um, there's an interesting um, blog um, by um, Tim Morgan, um, who promotes what he calls surplus energy economics. Um, so I'd want to know about those technologies, um, you know, what the um, uh, energy return on energy invested would be I, the time I, I, I would love to spend time answering that question I've done research into it okay um, so basically the question is um, can we build those systems um, quickly enough is the ret energy return on energy invested sufficient um, and is it sufficient, if you like, to um, fund, fund in energy terms further building of those systems? I mean, um, another... Those, those, um, are the, those are the key questions, you I agree yeah. with. So, um, yeah, we'd have to get in a long debate about it, I guess. Um, personally, nuclear fusion, um, for the reasons you've given, would be um, an unmitigated disaster because it would give us um, free license to um, uh, maybe not overshoot in carbon terms, but overshoot in other terms. Yes. Um, so I dread, I dread the possibility. It's interesting to see, I saw a report the other day that, um, that fusion is very much going private, um, mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's another issue. Um, so, um, oh, I've seen statistics quoted um, uh, to um, deal with it, replace fossil fuels with um, fission um, systems, nu nuclear fission systems. I've seen um, statistics, something like um, for a, um, it would require the building of um, one new 300 megawatt fission um plant every i think it was every two or three days mm -hmm. um, the lead time on building them is something like eight years um, given the absolute urgency of um dealing with um our carbon emissions i don't know um that they could even if these technologies come to fruition that there could be a, a solution in the short term and i think it's the short term that that matters I, I'd like to discuss those times with you. I don't want to extend extend my interrupt time here, um, uh, but I, I think maybe we could. We'll have time to come back to it, John. There's there's at least uh, three other folks. If uh, you wouldn't mind holding yeah. some of those those questions, no, not not at all. Thank you. Okay. Thank thanks, John. And uh, you, um, 
Uh, I know that uh, degrowth is really important, but if you could turn a light on, people would like to see <laughs> oh. see your face. <laughs> Sorry, good point. So, uh, and uh, Carrie would be next, and then Patricia, and then Brian. Hi. Hugh, I wonder whether you wanted to spend a minute or two describing something about how you envisage practically um, implementing um, accounting for administering um, a carbon rationing system from a kind of practical point of view. And the other thing just I was wondering was, was something you said before about if the economy shrinks, it'll automatically reduce other kinds of destruction. That's not your words. I can't quite remember exactly what it was. Yeah. But I wondered um, if you had thoughts on um, like where externalities fit into that and, and is there a risk that when um, the official monetized bits of the economy shrink, that actually more people might end up imposing externalities directly on the environment because they can't make get what they were wanting through the official economy. Yeah. That was my question. Okay, that's that's a very good point. Um, um, there's possibly a a, a good example of that. Um, there's a lot of talk in the, the degrowth movement about localization. Um, and to a certain extent, localization is, is um, an effect um, as much as a cause that, um, that of necessity, we will have to be more localized. But um, somebody I read recently, um, an Australian economist, um, sorry, I can't remember the name, um, pointed out that um, that's all very well, but um, what about the infrastructure that you need for localized um, communities, et cetera, et cetera? Do you duplicate that? Um, and again, that's a symptom of um, thinking of these, these solutions as, um, something that exists magically on their own and not how we get to them from here. Um, another example might be um, that um, as um, energy inputs decrease, um, the costs of um, a lot of agriculture will go up. And that means that um, certain, um, that farms that are more marginal, uh, that are marginal um, at the moment, will be driven out of, um, out of business. Um, that means that, um, that possibly, I don't know, it's, um, but possibly um, a lot of land um, will go out of use. Now, you know, you could, um, that could be a positive thing or it could be a negative thing. I mean, how might it be exploited? Um, in other ways, especially as people get desperate about um, if, if, sorry, if they're allowed to become desperate, if they're not supported, they're allowed to become desperate about their livelihoods and what that, um, what that might mean in terms of greater um, um, destruction of that land. It's not necessarily going to turn into um, verdant, um, um, uh, long life forests. Um, so yes, that, um, that is a very good question. Um, and that's um, one of the reasons we need those mitigating policies to direct, direct the side effects I talked about um, in one direction or the other. Um, and sorry, I've, I've forgotten your first question. My first question was about the technicalities, the technical, how do you implement a carbon, how might one possibly implement? If the, gov if the government decided next week it wanted oh, right. to implement a carbon um, rationing system, what would it, what would it might it practically look like? Uh, how might 
you practically put that something like that in place? Um, most of these systems seem to rely on um, something similar to um, you know, a debit card. Um, that each person in the country will be allocated a certain amount of energy. Um, certain goods um, would be would have a um, a price, um, uh, an energy price on them, and that as you bought them, you would um, your um, energy debit card would be um, would be debited. Um, so in essence, they rely um, on the on existing infrastructure. Um, Steve Keane's system called Universal Carbon Credits goes all the way to um, pricing every commodity um, and would rely on um, um, a digital currency. Um, so um, clearly there's a lot more to it than that, depending on the nature of, you know, exact nature of the system. Um, you'd have to... Um, if we, um, products would have to be quantified in terms of carbon, okay? Which means that um, uh, with, with fossil fuels, or most fossil fuels, that would be a fairly straightforward um, process. So um, especially at um, point of importation, um, which you know, would be the case here because we import most of our, our fossil, fossil fuels. Um, sorry, does that... So can I just, I'll, I'll try not to make this drag it too long, but does that mean basically a dual accounting system alongside dollars yeah, everywhere just... that dollars occur in the economy? So every shop, yeah. every trading operation would have well, to be... Some scheme... Any... Sorry. Some schemes um, focus primarily on energy, and that is because the um, that reduces the um, the overheads of of the the parallel accounting that you've just referred to. Um, so the range of of fuels is fairly um, is fairly narrow. It's relatively easy to um, account for them. Um, other schemes go all the way to um, accounting for every. Um, every product um, in terms of its carbon content. Um, the infrastructure's there um, or will be, you know, especially if we go to um, digital currencies, but still it's a mammoth, um, a mammoth job. So um, just accounting for um, fuels, um, you know, the 80-20 rule applies. You get the biggest bang for your buck um, simply by looking at fuels. There are other that, things like cement, for instance, um, and possibly it could be extended to that, but um, I'm mm. not sure about how important cement is relative to, to actual fuels. Does that, does okay. the system uh, like Carrie, that potentially um, take into account? Excuse me, Carrie, Sorry. I just want to uh, give a couple of the other folks who have their hand up uh, an opportunity. Thank There's you. Somebody there with their, with their finger up. It's been worrying me. I see, I see Brian, but uh, Patricia Scott's just ahead of Brian and Brian oh, okay. next. Go ahead, Patricia. Yes, uh, kia ora everybody. Um, you, you've talked a little bit about localization. And it's something that I've been involved with for many years. And it's something that's happening all over the world and to, um, all over New Zealand, only it's under the radar. Um, but what seems to me the value of localization is that it is the best way to transition because as the global economy declines, then the local economy can grow. And so that, they go alongside each other. Um, it seems to me that localization, I think this is what Hugh said, is, is going to be inevitable anyway, because globalization is so carbon intensive yeah. with um, long distance travel that we are going to have to go back 
to the sort of economy that we had in the 60s and 50s, where just about everything was made within 50, set for very rural places, 50 miles of where you lived or 100 miles of where you lived, whether it was furniture or your electric stove or clothes or shoes. And that doesn't seem to me to be too difficult a thing to work towards if we, we are charging for the um, amount of energy that's used for the, for the travel. So, um, the, and the other thing that I wanted to ask you was, people are terrified of recession. And how do we describe degrowth um, in comparison with a recession? Okay, um, about localization. Um, I don't think we can say that um, the economy will necessarily be deglobalized. I mean, take, take New Zealand's position. Um, we've got a very hollowed out economy. Um, our um, manufacturing um, took a hit um, back in the 80s. Um, so um, I feel more that we're going to have to be extremely selective about what we import. Um, that we are going to, um, you know, there's a lot of um, technical infrastructure that we may still have to import um, or abandon. I mean, um, computer chips. Um, I don't think we're ever going to make them here. Um, and um, we face a choice then between doing, doing away with the things that need them or... Um, um, prioritizing them as something we must, uh, must import. And I think it's probably fair to say that the same applies between um, small localized communities and, um, and big cities or um, regional hubs, that um, there are certain things that are going to um, need to be manufactured need to be, well, not necessarily need to be manufactured um, in regional hubs and dispersed to communities, but you mentioned, um, you mentioned stoves. Um, if we have the infrastructure to build stoves in every um, local community, uh, we will have to spend an awful lot of money and an awful lot of energy um, establishing that infrastructure. So, um, Food growing, um, probably very localised. Um, anything built, um, maybe not so much. Um, I was actually using the word localised. You can yeah. be localised in a small community, but you can be, I think you could still be localised within a, a, or to the extent of one big city or yeah. big, big towns. And that's still reducing the um, amount of transport that's required. Although you've got to transport the, the steel or whatever it is that you are using yeah. from the um, place yeah. where that comes from. Oh, sure. For, fair yeah. point. It's a, it's a relative term, I guess, is what we're both saying, rather than, a, than a, an absolute thing. But certainly localising where possible um, is going to be essential. I, I just don't, I think talking about degrowth is absolutely going to put people off. I don't think we should even mention the word. It may be what happens, but if we focus on what we're going to do because we're getting rid, we're going to do our, reduce our carbon emissions, then these other things happen automatically. Um, and they have good social, really good social effects as well. So I, I think trying to sell a word like deep growth won't help. Mm. Oh, well, there I have to absolutely disagree with you. I mean, I'm very much of the school of thought that, um, you know, we have to face up to it. It is what it is. It is degrowing the economy. That's what we have to do. So how is it different uh, from uh, a recession? Excuse me, Patricia. Uh, yeah. Brian okay. has been very patient with his hand up. And uh, I think it will, we'll give him okay. a chance. Go ahead, Brian. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank, thank you, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Great. Great. Um, I'm, I'm speaking for myself here, but um, probably there's a good deal of um, XR Tamaki Makarau behind what I'm saying as well. Um, I think that I just want to start from uh, very briefly from a climate point of view and then ask a couple of questions. Um, First of all, I don't think that the climate responds to um, our talk of degrowth and um, how we're going to maybe buy forests offshore to offset. Um, I think the physics is a completely different issue. Um, and just sort of leading on from this, um, are we expecting to degrow into more capitalism, essentially? Is that the system that's going to see us through? Um, we're not going to mention degrowth. We're going to go local. Um, I, seem, I seem to remember Adrian Orr talking along these lines about three years ago. And um, I don't think that was tremendously successful. Um, he never really got to the nub of the issue. And I agree. Look, there's plenty of intelligent conversation gone here tonight. It's fantastic. I, I don't not um i think that sir david king or david king has said that we've got three to four years i just put that into the chat earlier on you know to change what we do because it's going to alter the next thousand years of climate and environment on this planet are we going to manage that through capitalism in the next three to four years are we going to manage the markets somehow and manipulate them in the next three to four years by some kind of major pr um, strategy. I'm not sure how we're going to do that. I think being local is fantastic. Pat, I just totally agree with you on that. Um, so I just want to ask a couple of questions now, really. And it's about, it's about the fact, are we really going to degrow into capitalism? I think we need to be quite clear about that, whether we run a parallel currency or not. Is capital capitalism going to linger around in the background as it has done for 200 years plus? In fact, longer than, longer than that. Um, we've had ups and downs with capitalism. Um, and it's always there ready to come back. If we don't have something ready to go when the void is created, then we know who's going to step in and it's not going to be the degrowth greens or extinction rebellion. It's going to be the capitalists with plenty of digital currency, which is completely meaningless. Um, and I can talk at length of that about international banking. It's my total training. I, mean, okay. I, yeah. I put this into the country with Citibank, you know. Um, so th that's an endless route and we can't fight that. Yeah. Um, I think the only thing, and, and th really I'm just sort of wanting to plant a seed and ask opinion of this, is are we going to really go along talking about things or are we actually going to do something? Are we going to join with other groups around the country, other movements? And I'm not talking about what's gone in in Wellington in the last two weeks or so, which is just a copycat of Ottawa, which started a little bit before us. Um, are we going to look on along that route and be totally disorganized? Or are the left wing, for lack of a better term, going to get together from Extinction Rebellion through to Degrowth Greens and Greenpeace and the rest of us? and Generation Zero and get together and face the government and say, we've got to get out of this system. We've got to change the political system and we've got to change the economic system. Personally, I can't see any other way. I've looked, I've looked at the things overseas. I mean, what do you think, guys? This is out to Hugh and everyone. Are we really going to change it talking like this? I'm, I'm being pretty hard, pretty harsh, I know. But this is the way this is the way we talk in Extinction Rebellion, Tam Mickey McCara. <laughs> okay. We we, yep. we need to get we need to get some action with younger people. Thanks everyone. Okay, thank you. So was that was that a question to me or a question to the wider? Well group? it's a question. well quite, well, Hugh, you're the main spokesperson or the main person here. So yeah, I guess it's you, but everyone else needs to think about it, I think, seriously. Okay. Um very good question. Um uh I my preferred approach, well, <laughs> it just occurred to me, I don't know how I can answer that with just more talk, um, but I guess I have to. Um, 
I don't believe in um, piecemeal solutions. Um, I mention carbon rationing because I see that, if I'm right, I see that as a um, something that might unlock things, that might disable capitalism, perhaps with one of the two, one or two other key policies. If I'm right, um, I think it's something that everybody needs to something that needs to be pushed um, by every damn group in the country. And um, part of what we've been trying to do is make contact with um, other groups and try and persuade them of that. Um, there are vested interests, I mean, reasons why people don't fancy the idea. Um, people are committed to the ETS um, and there are a host of reasons um, for that. But yes, I agree with you. Um, I think that um, we need to, pardon me, I was about to say, hold the, go hold the government to ransom. Um, in these times, that's probably not a good, a good way to put it. But um, yeah, united action is essential. And I think uh, not on multiple fronts, but choosing one lever to disable capitalism. Because it, for me, anyway, it's the only way. Hugh, can capitalism, Thanks. can this system uh, sorry, uh, bootstrap Brian, itself? Excuse me, Brian, there, there's, um, I'm just conscious sorry. of the time and kind of want to respect it, even though I think we're going to go over a little bit. My apologies. Um, and, and Judy and Joel have a hand up there, so we'll give them an opportunity to uh, ask, ask a question. Go ahead, uh, yeah. Judy or Joel. Um, well, that, that's actually me this time. I'm, it's not really a question. I, I, I'm finding some inspiration from a lot of what people are saying about challenging government policy and localizing and stuff. I'm also finding that there's a, there's a lot of sort of theoretical talk about how we, we, we might need to do this or that, but we probably aren't going to get there is kind of how it sounds to me. And maybe I'm misunderstanding or misinterpreting. <clears throat> my, my concern is for those most vulnerable among us, what can they do? What can we do to help them to survive whatever is coming down the pike, which we, we can't know the shape of, but it doesn't look good from everything that I'm hearing from you. <clears throat> Sorry, having that problem. Um, and my, and my the, the best answer that I can come up with is that people, people need to be encouraged and supported to take control of their own lives. People, um, I, I put the New Economy Coalition in, um, in the chat, New Economy, dot something um anyway you can look up new economy coalition and, and find out what they're doing but what they are doing is actually that they're supporting people who are taking power locally of their workplace of their communities these are the these are the most vulnerable when i say that i'm talking about people of color poor people um <clears throat> and they're doing that by establishing businesses that are actually run by the workers themselves. They're doing that by establishing communities that um, <clears throat> by working towards communities that support community um, empowerment. And, and to me, that's the thing that can, if anything can, that's the one thing that can help us to sort of fill in where the disastrous system leaves us when it when it leaves us behind. So I, I guess it's not a question. It's it's more of a speech. But um, but I'm happy to hear other people's thoughts on that. Um, do you want me to comment on that or? Yeah, go ahead. You, if, if you can keep it brief, uh, just because we're we're going over time. But thank you, Joel. Are there more people waiting? Um, I don't believe so. But but uh, we're, okay. we're already a bit over time, so if oh, you'd okay. like to respond, right. uh, make it make a comment. 
on the points that Joel has raised. Okay, first I would just want to say, uh, Brian, um, that last point that you raised is something I've been thinking about quite a lot recently. So if you want to contact me about that, um, I'd be interested. Um, there's a, um, sorry, uh, Joel, um, there's a lot in, in what you said um, and I have mixed feelings about it. Um, again, it goes, possibly for me, it, it, that distinction I made before about post-growth and, and, and degrowth, um, none of these things are going to bring about degrowth. Um, they are absolutely essential for post-growth, um, the systems that we have in place to support each other um, when we reach that state. Um, I don't know if that was what you were really asking me or, or asking people. Um, that, yeah, um, perhaps if we just leave it as a, as a, as an observation for people to, to talk about and, um, and this. Okay. Um, well, we're, we're a bit over and I'll just make some closing comments. And, uh, first of all, thank you, you, uh, I think you've done a terrific job at, at presenting some very complex ideas and helping us uh, with some of the, the major themes and issues and, and um, um, contradictions even within the, um, you know, the, the degrowth movement itself, and as well as um, some of the directions that may go forward. Uh, it's not surprising we haven't come to a conclusion about uh, simple actions to take in the last uh, two, you know, two hours. Uh, as I said, this is this is an unprecedented predicament we're in, and and it's going to take some time. And of course, we don't have a lot of time. I mean, the, the, you know, there's a sense of urgency here because we're we're doing destruction on a daily basis. Um, as a possible next step, I wanted to alert everyone not only to the fact that this series of webinars is um, devoted to the same issue of of we don't necessarily use the degrowth terminology, but the economy of enough is about the same, same concepts, same issues, same goals, same sense of urgency. Also, uh, Deirdre Kent has begun a degrowth group. And uh, uh, I'm sure Deirdre would be happy for us to put up uh, some information about that on the our Climate Declaration website. So when we put up um, a copy of this session that we're recording, uh, we'll also put up some information about the initiative that Deirdre is taking. So that anyone, uh, whether you're part of the Degrowth Greens or just interested and concerned about these issues and would like to continue, not just the conversation for the sake of a conversation, but for the sake of how do we move forward? How do we, what actions can we collectively take and build some synergy together uh, to make things happen that need happening? Um, the, um, you know, stick with the degrowth greens if that's where you're already involved or uh, link in with what Deirdre is doing or do both. <laughs> you know, there's no, there's uh, no limitations on this except your own time and energy. So again, thank you very much, you. Um, thank you all um, who participated. My apologies to those of you who I had to cut short. Uh, each of those conversations would have been very, very desirable to follow, but uh, we'll just have to leave it for another time and, and um, honor the timing that we have uh, set for this if, session. If so, anybody wants to follow up any of those, um, those points, um, please do get in touch. And if anybody has some, any nuts and bolts um, suggestions for um, what might go into a transition plan, about the process of building a transition plan, about anything to do with that, I would be delighted to hear from you. Thank you. Right. Or join us for the next webinar next month. Okay, good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Be well, stay well, act locally.